Hey, it's Dan Kenner, host of The Casual Author. Today is Monday, September 18th, 2023, as I record this. And this is episode number 89 of the podcast. We're really close to 90. And next is going to be 100, which is absolutely crazy. Uh, today, we're talking to D. Alexander about how he took his passion project, a story that was really close to his heart from his teenage years, into independently published work. And the process after publishing it for the first time, of iterating on it, fixing it, and making it an even better read for his readers. We talk a lot about the challenges of independent publishing and marketing and things that he has done to try to make that a smoother process for himself, as well as a lot of his learnings as a part of that process. So I think you'll really want to stick around for that conversation. It's really awesome, and I think you'll learn a lot. So in terms of updates... Um, so we'll start with homestead updates. I think those are generally the ones that are top of mind for me because that is just what we're doing all the time is working out with the animals. So this past couple of weeks, I've been the goal has been to dig post holes to cement in some posts so that we can build a, a permanent outdoor run for our chickens. So I don't have any great pictures of it, but our chickens, they were in a pretty small space and it was a completely covered chicken run which we didn't love, right? Because chickens need to get out. They need to get sunlight, helps them with their egg production. If you didn't know that, chickens need sunlight in order for them to lay eggs, which is why in places such as Idaho, where we are, when the sun isn't up for very long in the winter, that's part of the reason their egg production decreases. It's good for them. They, they need a rest. But, you know, even in the summer months, when they're not out in the fields, which is where they are today, we want them to have more sun, even in the winter. So we're building this outdoor run. I'm shocked that I was able to get the post holes dug because I just had this manual post hole <laughs> digger, which I've used before, but I managed to uh, break it. I, I bent the edge. I just need to hammer it back out straight, but I bent the edge and it wasn't digging very effectively. So I just brute force through it. Fortunately, I had a couple guys uh, that that helped me. They were they're serving in the area, doing volunteer work in the area, and they offered to help. It was excellent. Between the three of us, we got them all dug. The rest of them dug in about a day. And I did the cementing of that yesterday. So all that cement is working on setting. I think I did that on Saturday. Crazy how fast time goes. Saturday, I did the, the cementing. They all look nice and straight. It's perfect. Once that cements perfectly, then I'll put up the, the boards, the cross beams, and then we'll put up the chicken wire, which we're going to try chicken wire this year. It's not as secure as hardware cloth. I don't know the difference. Chicken wire is, they're kind of hexagonal, big holes in the wire. It's not as tough. Uh, it's woven wire, so you can actually you can tear through it if you're strong. I mean, I I don't know if a lot of people can, but it, it, animals, if they're really persistent, could probably rip through it. We're going to try it because it's, they don't need to be as secure. Um, normally, at least this is what we did with our last one, we would put hardware cloth, so it's thicker wire, and it's like a beast when it scrapes you, but it's just woven wire. Uh, that's really tight and stronger and very thicker, thicker and harder. It's a bigger gauge. And so, like I said, when it, when it scratches you, you'll be cutting in because it's in a roll. Um, once you cut the last thing, if you're not careful, it'll snap back and it'll just rake against your skin. I have tons of scrapes, not this last time, but when I've used hardware cloth in the past, it just tears you up. <laughs> so that's good though, because it protects the chickens. In this case, we're just gonna use chicken wire. I'm sure it'll protect them just fine. But I'm um, pretty happy where, we're with, where we are now. About a month ago, if you asked me would I be done with the post holes and cemented in, I didn't think that I would. It was just taking so long to dig those post holes, and I didn't have a lot of time per week. But that's good. Those are done. Um, in other news, we'll start with the good news because we don't want to get into the bad news right away. Um, the, the other good news is that we sold the final three baby goats. We've never had baby goats take this long to sell. We, we're grateful that someone asked for all three at the same time, which was perfect. Then they had a place to go. They're going to another farm with lots of other animals and they're going to be pets for kids. So they're going to just have a blast. We're really happy that they found a new home and that we don't have to feed them. They, we just had no need for them. Uh, we already have plenty of pets. Plus they, uh, they're just eating lots of Hey, our hay resource was going, it was getting eaten very quickly. So very grateful that they have a new home. Um, and we, you know, we didn't charge a crazy amount for them because we really just wanted to rehome them. It was either that, or I hate to say this, it was either that or the freezer. And I didn't want to do that, but you know, you do what you got to do. It just made sense, but I'm happy that they're pets now. So that's all perfect. Um, in other news, the sad, the sad news 
is Emma. I don't know if you're, I've talked a little bit about Emma before. She was the little gray barn cat that coincidentally went viral on TikTok, got the somewhat 12, 13 million view video. Unfortunately, she got hit by a car this last week. So that has not been the best thing in the world. The The reality of it is barn cats living outside. They, you know, it's kind of survival of the fittest situation. There's nothing that we could do to keep her off the road. She was set so far back. They were, you know, two, 300 feet away from the, the busy road. They're so far from the busy road. Um, but when a cat gets to a curious age, it's it, it's there's really nothing we can do. So it was in the middle of the night. We didn't find her until the morning. It's really sad. Obviously, my children are very upset. Um, so definitely not the best news to share. Uh, but you know, once again, there's not a lot that we can do there. So right now we still have the three barn cats, and those are the three that we've had them for a long time. I think they've kind of learned the road is not a safe place. We we've, we've had a couple of cats hit by cars as well. And it tends to be at about this age. They get really curious and they stray out there in the middle of the night. There's lots of really fast drivers and I don't know if they didn't see her or what. So that is the not great news. Um, but in an effort to help my children, uh, my son in particular is distraught because he played with them all the time. But we do have another little kitten that we we got. So it's a little boy kitten this time. His name, we've named him Turner. He's, he's just a little guy, but we're hoping that he is able to learn the dangers of the road and once again they're set so far back um but i guess they just get really curious and they stray really really far they've got plenty of place to roam away from the road we're hoping that he chooses to stay where his mom is and the other um, people are the other cats are and everything will go well on that front but you know it's hard to say we'll see in any case that is one of the unfortunate things that happened this week but other than that, we've been spending a lot of time taking the milk that we're getting. We're in a really high milk production period. So we we're turning that into cheese and freeze drying it as much as possible to store it for the winter. So my wife makes about, I want to say six to seven pounds of cheese per week. Hard cheeses such as cheddar, farmhouse cheddar is what you call it. She makes Gouda, Buder Kesa. She does make lots of mozzarella, mozzarella as well, which is great because we make homemade pizzas. But we're just storing that as much of that in the freezer as possible. It has to or slash the fridge. So a lot of the cheeses have to um, sit for a while. It makes them, you know, get sharper and more flavorful. So they'll sit for like six weeks to three months. You just vacuum seal them and let them sit to kind of make their flavor more robust. But that's where we are with the homesteading. Um, I think that's everything. Updates. There was a lot this week. <laughs> but let's see. Uh, in terms of author updates. I did take a little bit of a brief hiatus from editing to write a short story, which is something I've never done before. So uh, the more, I'm part of a writing group. I think I talked a little bit about this last week. The writing group, we decided, hey, let's enter this competition. It's a short story competition. It goes on every quarter. And they said, let's just do it as a group. It'll be fun. We'll each write one and then read each other's and critique each other's. And then we'll all submit for quarter four of 2023. And I had no experience with writing a short story. I did end up finishing it. It's just over 15,000 words, which I don't think is normal for a short story, but I'm proud of myself because I don't, I'm not great at writing short things. And for me, I felt like it was really great exercise to write a story in completed form in such a short amount of words. So like I said, it's just over 15,000 words. Um, the limit is 17,000. So I met it. But there were a couple of things I had to skimp on detail wise because my inclination is to just add so much. I'm an epic fantasy writer and I just want to write a lot of stuff. So it turned out great. Uh, the feedback I got from my group was that it was excellent. I thought it was really right there. Just had to tweak a couple of things, a little bit character development that I skimped on knowingly because I didn't want to get too close to the 17,000 word limit. I don't want to be that guy that submits a 16,999 word short story <laughs> just because I can. So I tried to keep it a little bit shorter. It did mean I skimped on some things. So I added more to fix those things and cut from other unnecessary places. But we're in a place that I think is good. Now, I've I've called it, the title of it is The Seduction of Thieves. And I think that probably what's going to happen is um, whether or not I win this competition, which if I do, great. If not, I'm still going to use it. I will probably cover it myself and then I will give it away free with Shielded as a prequel story. So when I wrote this story, it kind of was framed 
to be the starter or the prequel to an epic fantasy series. I don't know how many books I would love to write almost like a serialized mystery type fantasy series where there can be up to 15, 17, 20 books, you know, I'd love to do something like that. So I think that's what I'll do with this. I'll give it away for free and have it be a lead in. Now, I'm not going to write those other books <laughs> probably for a while, but I figure why not? It's a story. I can give it away for free. Maybe people will be enticed by it and you know, start reading something like the Light Bear Chronicles or some of the other books that I'm writing, even though the style is a little bit different from the YA series, Dragon Blooded, that I'm writing. Uh, I have not touched Dragon Blooded edits since I got them back still for a good reason, because I wanted to get this short story done. I didn't want to be distracted. And then I do want to get the Cyber City books out as well. So I know my co-author is currently waiting on me to finish my edits for those three books. I finished book one which is excellent. I'm on book two. It got a little bit slowed up by some unfortunate circumstances. Um, the book, it already had some edits and I had to go through and review those edits before I could go do my own edits. Anyway, it's not a problem. Now I'm going through and doing it myself, hoping to finish those edits by the end of this week, jump into book three. And if I can get that finished, you know, within a week or two period, then I can finally get into the dragon blooded edit. So that's the hope. There's just so much going on. <laughs> I don't probably shouldn't work on so many projects at once, but you know, it is what it is. But yeah, I think, I think that's it for the author updates. Other than that, if you are, if you haven't joined my email list, I welcome you to, you may have noticed that I did not send one last week. I think I'm planning on scaling back to every other week for my email list. That's once again, just to account for time, make sure that I can do it the best that I can and not feel too rushed. In the past with my weekly email, I felt like I was a little too rushed putting unnecessary slash really unclean <laughs> writing in it, which isn't great. Uh, in fact, a couple of weeks ago, my wife said, uh, do you want me to proofread your emails before I send them? I'm like, oh no, <laughs> what happened with it? She said, oh, there's just lots of typos in it. So not a huge deal. None of them were overly embarrassing, but Obviously, any typo isn't great. So in any case, that being said, I don't want to feel too rushed. I want to make sure that I'm sending it out in the proper cadence. So every other week is where we're going to land for sending out that email. If you have any questions or concerns, definitely let me know. Now, because this podcast does not have any sponsors, um, I will add a little note for myself. If you are listening to this on Apple Podcasts or somewhere else where you can leave a review, I'd really appreciate if you could leave a review slash star rating. Just let people know if it's, you know, what value you find in it. Share with your friends as well. I'm hoping to get, I'm trying to find more listener base. Social media isn't kind of reaching the audience that I'm hoping to reach. So if you know any other authors or writer friends or people that would be interested in listening to this content, definitely would love it if you could share and help in any way that you can. So I appreciate that. I don't believe there's any other updates. We can go ahead and shift over to the interview portion of the podcast. <music> How are you doing today? I'm doing really well. How are you? Doing really well also. I'm looking forward to picking your brain a little bit about your journey as an author, uh, where you get your inspiration and just learning about your author journey. It's something that um, always fascinates me. Everyone has a different story. Before we get into that, though, I'd love to ask, how long have you been writing and publishing? I have been writing since I can remember. Okay. It started as really bad fan fiction and over the years it's kind of morphed into what it is i started the memoirs of ellie kai series um back i want to say i'm like 15 16 years old i didn't get it published until 2018 i still published it and it's been a wild journey um i've learned so much and i just i can't wait for people to experience this wonderful story Awesome. So I'm I'm so curious about the fan fiction. What type of fan fiction was it? If, if you'll indulge okay. me, <laughs> unless no, you don't want to say. No, I do. I totally. So like, I was big into fantasy. I was that kid in the back of school that pretended he was a superhero. So like Inuyasha, Sailor Moon, Power Rangers, all of that stuff. Like magic, um, found family, overcoming the odds. That powerful message in the story. I wanted to create something like that. And that's how the memoirs of Elokai started with just bad fan fiction that as I grew and developed, so did the story. And then I realized, hey, this is fan fiction. I can't actually publish these stories. 
So it kind of just morphed into this grand epic tale that has just consumed my life. Since. I think all of the things you mentioned were totally popular when I was a kid too. And I definitely was very into those things as well. Although I've never dabbled in fan fiction. I've heard a lot of people say they really loved it. It was like the gateway into their writing. Um, it intimidated me completely, honestly, because all of the details, I felt like I would just get them wrong when I tried to write fan fiction. It's, and I think it's mine was bad because it was like borderline fan fiction, borderline original. Ah, mm-hmm. And then it had to be like, go into original, but like all stories are just what is it? They, what is it? They, they say that there's six original storylines and everything else just goes off that. Mm-hmm. So. That's, that's true. Yeah, it's interesting to think about it that way. Um, so I, I was always a lover of fantasy as well. It was one of those things where I read a lot, but I never thought that I would actually write. So when you were younger and writing these things and you realized, hey, I could publish these things, did you just dive into it knowing that you were one day going to 100% publish? Or were you just kind of like, oh, let's just see where this goes and maybe later I'll decide? No, it was always, I know this story is going to go out there, but I just never had the confidence to do it. Mm. I didn't know all the steps. And luckily, my best friend at the time, he, um, he was like a, he's a, he's very, very particular about grammar and punctuation and very, very clear about how it should be. So I was like, okay, great. So this guy can edit the book. I can tell the story. And, we just come from there, but I've always known that I was going to be an author. I just didn't know it was going to be that hard. Oh, yes. We'll talk about that in just a minute because I think that's something that we do. It's just the reality of publishing something that you don't think about. There's this kind of, um, what's what I'm looking for, allure or false, how do I say this? It's just this false sense that it's super easy and you just become famous. Anyway, we'll get into that in just a second. I do want to ask you, um, however, because I always love to hear uh your perspective on it obviously publishing is great no matter how you go about doing it what made you decide to go with the self-publishing route um lack of confidence um but it's very very set in how i wanted the memoirs the first memoirs to be the voice the tone and i didn't want anyone telling me that i was wrong (laughs) i have learned over the years that it was, it was lack of confidence, and I actually went through the whole traditional publishing for my new book, which we can get into later, but it's just, I love, now looking back on it, I love the freedom that I have with self-publishing. I love that I can create the cover art, the work with other indie authors to bring the story to life in a way that is in my own vision. Does that make sense? Absolutely, it does. And that's part of the reason I opted to self-publish as well. I've been through this a few times, but primarily it was the creative control, you know, not having unnecessary duress from people's opinions and wanting me to write things that maybe I didn't feel like writing or didn't want to write. Um, you know, we have the liberty as self-published authors to write whatever we'd like in how we in the way we want it, which I actually love. It's very yeah. freeing, so to speak. So let's talk about your actual books because you had two published books, correct? Plus a third that is coming out soon, which is exciting. Yeah. Absolutely love that. So let's talk about the books. What are they? Where did the inspiration come for these stories? So I uh, self-published a dark urban fantasy series called The Memoirs of the Latin. It is essentially um, about the final war between the King of Free Will and the Emperor of Destiny for the Eternal Throne. So I've always been huge into free will and destiny philosophy is one of my all time favorite things with mixing into, you know, the fantasy, the magic and the elements over the years, it crafted into this story. And essentially the first book follows young Danny Elikai who just lost his family in a horrific accident. And he's just depressed and he's like swirling in this darkness that seems to be tormenting him. And as the story progresses, he pulls himself out of it, and he finds out that he has to find the king of the will and bring him back before the crusaders of destiny rise to challenge the natural order. And it's been a wonderful experience uh, writing this story because it's a lot of my own growing up as a a kid with depression and trying to find solace in the mess and the fantastic. 
So that's it's always I, I love that you have these this this in here kind of aspects maybe not aspects of your life but you know as authors we always put ourselves into our work uh, which is such a scary part of the writing particularly when you already lack the confidence I agree with the lack of confidence thing um, sometimes I still I'm like am I is anything good that I'm publishing or is this all just like crap right. Um, but, you know, you went out on a long limb and you did that. And it seems like the book is being received very well. The book slash series uh, seems like it's receiving lots of love, so to speak. You know, it. I have been doing this since 2018 when I first published it. And this is, to, and this is where we come back to where that lack of confidence. When I published this book, uh, it wasn't professionally edited. There wasn't, like, it wasn't clear. And over the years, I've gotten some amazing feedback from friends and fans saying, hey, I love your story, but I think you should add this. Like, we never, in the first draft, in the first edition, we never had the, the point of view of who it was because it jumped between different people. So I added that in. And then they said, hey, we've noticed some grammar mistakes. So then I got it professionally edited. And then just recently, I actually remastered the first memoirs of Elokai and I got a lot of repetitive verbiage. So that's one of the great things about self-publishing. You get the control to do it your way. But on the vice versa, there's so many small details that go into it that I wish I had known before I first self-published it. But the story is being perceived really well. Uh, people that have read it have loved it. The thing with the Memoirs of Elokai is that it is a dark fantasy. And it really plays on human emotions and since it's set in like the real world it takes place in Grand Off Wisconsin it feels real to people when people want to escape out of real life that's so interesting I mean I knew it was a dark fantasy so but you know dark fantasy set in in the real world definitely does kind of blur the lines for some people between reality and your book which I think is great that's part of reading to be able to escape and just dive into the story um which is kind of fun. I admittedly haven't read your book. This is one of the things as a podcast host, I would love to read everybody's books prior to having you on the podcast. I have seen it and I've read the description and it does look fascinating. It looks great. Um, but I want to ask you because we talked, we'll get to the challenging aspects of the authoring. And I do, I don't want to forget talking about your book that's up and coming. But just while we're in here talking about the uh, authoring journey, I want to know from you, what is the most rewarding part of your journey so far as an author? It's been the response from the band. I actually just, one of my close friends on TikTok, she actually surprised me today on Instagram, and she drew the characters from the memoirs of our time, the kings of free will and his two generals from the second book, and she created artwork for them. And I got to see them through her eyes, and it was just so amazing to be able to see how she sees these characters and how much they impacted her like like the second general of free will amari she is from africa and to see that representation and she got to see herself as a general of light a general of free will one of the top generals and it meant the world to her and for her to create that for me because she was so proud of it it just blew me away and I like have it saved. I'm gonna get it printed. I'm just I'm really excited. But that's the best part of it is watching people fall in love with these characters and find their own representation, not only in the story, but like as a general, as a king. Like it's just one of the best parts for me. Absolutely. That when you find even, you know, readers in verbal ways just say, Oh, I loved your book. I really enjoyed X character. It's so fun because they they sometimes will love different things than you thought they would. Like, oh, you love that side character. I didn't expect that. But just the fact that they get so into it. And that's that's literally every author's dream is to have someone reach out to some, hey, I drew this art or I painted this or whatever of your characters. Like I would be so thrilled. <laughs> I think that's awesome. See, I've had it happen to me twice, and only twice, and it's been amazing. I think the best thing for me is one of my friends, he, um, he stopped reading years ago. And I just, like, hey, you know, I've had some really good feedback. My best friend's mom, she hasn't read a book since she was, like, 20. She's now in her 60s. She picked it up, and she loved it. Why don't you do it? 
he picked it up and he finished it the weekend and it re-inspired him to start reading again. So, I mean, that's just, those are one of the top two things that as a writer you can strive for. The other one is, your book saved my life. Yeah. So, I mean, those are the top three goals and I've hit two of them and at the end of the day, that's, that's good. Well, and you still have time, right? The great thing about publishing is it's going to be there forever, right? Yeah. So you, you've got some time to to um, reach those other goals, uh, even though it feels long <laughs> and sometimes yeah. arduous. Yeah, but when you finally when when you finally get there, um, you know, like I said, I've only have two books out in the same series, so hopefully with the set, with this new book coming out, I can reach a wider audience. And especially with the first two moments being cleaned up to really enhance the story. So I'm back to your thing. I'm really glad you haven't read it yet because now you get to experience it in the way that it should have been at the, at the beginning. Yeah, there you go. I'm glad that I got busy. <laughs> so yeah. that it's, it's, it all works out in the end, right? That's perfect. It really does. But the thing that you learn as an author, whether once again, traditionally or independently published, there are so many things that we say, I wish I knew this at the beginning. And we can't even go through the list. Like, there's just so much. I'm constantly every day like, oh, wow, I wish I knew that three years ago. Right. Um, but, you know, these types of conversations are a way to reach other authors who are in the beginning phase. They're like, oh, I learned this from from these people. So that being said, the challenges, I mean, the challenges of being an author are numerous. But I am curious to know from you, what what are what has been the most challenging part? of being a an author a self-published author so here a new one i just started doing this with my the book that's next month beta readers i never did beta readers for the first two memoirs of LA guy and that was to my detriment mm -hmm. because i never got outside people's opinions saying hey i'm confused on this or um maybe you should do this or something you have even thought of like oh this is a plot hole does that make sense so beta readers getting beta readers has been one of these most challenging experience that's for me right now because it's like you're putting this raw unfinished piece of work out there for these people to literally rip apart to make it better so and understanding that it's constructive criticism and they're to help you has been one of the hardest things because when i published the first two moments of those high, it was you know the perfect to me when they weren't does that make sense mm -hmm. absolutely um so yeah exactly something that like beta readers i definitely didn't have beta readers as well with my first couple books and it's one of those things you just realize feedback is good <laughs> it's painful sometimes but it's it's good and it's important because as authors sometimes we get in our head about the way we think a story should be and how fascinating a concept or character will be and you give it to someone who's a reader you know they look at it from at face value and they're like this is the, the reality this is what the i'm perceiving what you've given me like that is not what i intended so especially and you have to have a diverse um a diverse population of arc readers mm -hmm. to get different perspectives when one person understands it but the other person doesn't so then you're like well what do i like how do i bridge that gap so I'm curious to know, how do you bridge the gap? <laughs> so like, how, how have you approached it as an author? So actually, I had this just happen in my new work of practice that's coming out here soon. And I had two different conflicting uh, opinions, one from the perspective of the character and one from an outside perspective. And it was saying, hey, I didn't really understand this character in the beginning versus the, per the person who comes from that says, No, I totally understand it. And it was saying, okay. So like as me as a queer man, I understand this perspective, but someone looking on the outside of that, how do I make it more clear to them what's happening? And that's just being a little bit more detailed in like the characters, like why this is happening, why am I feeling this way? Instead of making it vague, because I will understand it, but that doesn't mean someone else won't. So it's just opening up the dialogue a little bit more to kind of bridge that. No, it's an well, interesting... Well, I'll be successful. We'll find out. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that's a really in healthy perspective to have, right? Because we can't implement every piece of feedback that we receive because otherwise it would just get 
you know, confusing and it might get a little muddled because everybody has different opinions, but you recognize, okay, why is this person feeling or experiencing this, these questions? Oh, likely because of maybe they are not in the same demographic or maybe they have um, a different way of living or whatever. So how can I broaden that, open that up? So not only them, but other people who might not be in the same place as me can be invited in and partake or enjoy of enjoy that experience as well. So, I mean, that's, that's the way you need to think about with feedback. It's not always about like, Oh, make this change, make this change, you know? All right. Just following directions. It's just broadening your perspective. It's like, Oh, these are questions I didn't consider because I am who I am, which is good. It's the type of feedback you need. Um, What about, (laughs) sorry, go ahead. No, No, please please go ahead. Oh, I was going to switch gears. So if you have something that you wanted no, to say. I'm good. No, get beta readers, everyone. Get beta readers. Get beta readers. Don't forget the beta slash arc readers. You know, yeah. different steps of the process, but simply important feedback from them. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the probably least fun subject of all of it. That is finding readers. The marketing aspects, <laughs> because that is so challenging. I'm curious to know from your experience. So this book was published uh, five years ago, or you know, around five years ago, 2018. What have you learned since then around finding readers for your book? Um, marketing is number one. When you get out of the door, you have to have a clear vision of what your book is, the tropes of those books. I had no idea what that was with the number of campaigns. The number of Elikai was actually first published was just a YA fantasy. Okay. It was YA. And I didn't know like tropes like found, uh, found family, elements of magic. Like I didn't know any of those tropes, which was the detriment to the number of Elikai trying to get out there. And just there was no, back in 2018, there was, there was not much time. First time, I think it was just starting. And getting on with Facebook and Messenger was so hard to break into. So it just, it was challenging. But now with, you know, book talk and all these things like my new book coming out, like very defined of what this book is, the categories evolve into, and why you should pick it up. Why is the number one point? When you're going to the readers, you need to say, this is why you should read my book. With the memoirs of Elikai, why you should read the book, it is a dark fantasy about a queer king of free will that is taking on for the eternal throne. Yes. Found family, elemental magic, rising evil, and a reluctant hero. And also mental illness awareness and healing from that. Like, that's number one challenge for me is knowing what the book is and how to get into the hands of people that want to read that. That is so hard sometimes to identify. So, but very important, right? Because if you think about it, if you as an author can't identify those important points, how can you expect readers to be able to see your book and say, I want to read that because I know it contains X, X, and X. Well, I mean, they don't know (laughs) unless you help them know that. And the thing is, you have to be very careful because for me, I have been listening, like you said, too many voices are muddling it. Yeah. So we went from a YA fantasy to a dark horror to a grim dark. And finally, I was just like, no, this is a dark urban fantasy. And I'm cutting it off there. Listening to outside perspectives, at the end of the day, knowing what your book is about and how to get into the hands of these people. Like, the memoirs of Elikai is an amazing, beautiful story, but it's painful. And some people just are not ready for that. Mm-hmm. Maybe they're not. They're looking for something a little more light an airy yeah. fantasy because those exist and there's nothing wrong with those entertainment is entertainment and it's there's emotions all over the place it can be light and fluffy and it can be heavy and dark and you know it's just you got to know what you're looking for don't want to be um incorrectly surprised <laughs> by the content that you're reading so let's talk about this new book that's coming out is it related to your current books is the story completely different is it another dark fantasy no so um Dawn of God's United Rights is a gay dystopian romance that takes place in the year 2122, about 150 years after this religious ideology overtook the American Republic. And it's about these two young men who meet, it's love at first sight, they fall in love, love, and navigating this under this tyrannical government that will kill them if they find out. And it's about him 
Leon, the main character, taking a blind leap into true love as his uncle is going to be chosen to be the new divine leader of the of God's United Reich. And it's not the story you think it is. It's all about overcoming darkness, love, and light. And I'm really excited about it because go back to one of the most challenging things about marketing this, this book is all about love at first sight with a dystopian romance, hurt and comfort. And I'm just, I'm really excited about it. So do you feel like when you went, set out to write this book that you had, um, how do I say this? I don't want to say writing to market because this isn't necessarily writing to market, but it sounds like you've kind of chosen specific elements to include in an effort to appeal to a certain audience. Is that correct? So actually, I actually started writing Dawn about the same time I started the memoir to Oh, okay. Nice. And over the years, it's kind of developed and changed as I have. And especially with everything that's going on in the world right now in the country, I felt that it was important to tell this story. Not a story of like Handmaid's Tale or 1984 where it's a tragedy, but rather hope and light and love and the like these tropes kind of just aligned with that. Mm-hmm. So when I was going through and I said, okay, what are the tropes of this book? And I was looking through this, like, this is the fifth, the fifth. The story aligns itself. Does that make sense? Yep, absolutely. It does. The other reason I ask is because it is a definite marketing strategy to write to market. Um, I've never done anything like that. Uh, and this, this doesn't sound exactly like that, but I think it is important to recognize that what there might be some interest in. And even if it's about framing your book just slightly to be like, oh, this does appeal to these popular things. I think that's where marketing comes in is being able to take what you have and appeal to the right people. Because I'd like to say that there's an audience for every book. There really is. There's an audience for everybody. It really comes down to finding that audience, targeting them properly. Yeah, and that's that's the number one thing I'm doing right now with Dawn as I got it back from the beta readers and I'm making the changes that they suggested. Finding the right people for the market too. So like on BookTok, I'm targeting like the high queer influencers give them free PR boxes to say, here's this story. This is why you should be reading it. And like help. And I'm really excited because the overwhelming response from these advanced art readers is becoming really positive. So it's all about knowing your story and knowing who to give it to. And it always is encouraging to have a positive response <laughs> to advanced readers. So I'm glad to hear that you're having that experience because I know other authors have had not as great experiences, but it sounds like you're having a good one. Yeah, and the thing is, it's like, I um, when you think of this story, when you think of two young men falling in with a tyrannical religious government, you think you know this story. That's not the story I wanted to tell, and that's how I'm approaching it with these readers and how I will approach it going forward after it's published that this story is, I want to say it's a beacon of light and of hope, not the tragedy that you think it's going to be. Which could be a good thing, right? Pleasant surprise. Yeah, and it, it's actually going to be a trilogy. So those elements of that story will play throughout the series, but it, I wanted to tell a different story. And I guess that's where it comes down to me as a writer, especially with the memories of Elkai, is telling a different story. Mm-hmm. Well, along with those similar tropes that come so easily with the book. I think that's awesome. So have you already written the other two books as well, or are they still in the works? <laughs> no. So I actually, so the funny thing is Dawn actually started off as just two books. Oh, okay. The first, first book was actually going to be over 200,000 words. And when I was starting to query for traditional agents, one of, one of the best agents I responses was, this book is amazing. But it, it won't publish with this link. Like, it just won't. And she's like, so you need to either cut it down by like 100,000 words or break it in half. But luckily, in the story, there was a natural breaking point. So I just broke it and made it a trilogy. So who doesn't love a trilogy? I love trilogies. I'm a big fan of trilogies. So with this book, is this that you're going self-publishing route for this one as well, Don? Or are you, you, are you going with an agent traditionally published? So I went to the process of publishing and I got so much amazing feedback 
while doing it that I felt with my marketing plan and the, the theme of the story that I could do it better self publishing it. So that's what I'm doing. Awesome. And like I said, getting it right into the right hands, see people talking about it before the release. And then what comes after the release, you know, presenting like the character art, um, adding in the music that I'm going to have written for the story from my, my friend Tyler. He's a composer. Mm, cool. That conversation open. You've got all sorts of cool friends. Got a composer yeah. friend and a grammar, a grammarian friend and all these. I think that's awesome though. You know, leverage the support network that you have and ask for their expertise and help in, with your books. I think that's perfect. Well, it comes from the years of desperate, please help me. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we all find ourselves in that uh, phase all the time, the desperate, please help me. But, you know, it's great to, to have people that are willing to help. And it's encouraging, right? Because oftentimes as an author, self-published author particularly, it can feel very isolating, which is ironic because there's lots of authors that are doing the same things like us. But still, it can feel isolating. And, you know, it's really funny is that I see all of these amazing people on TikTok and I have made some incredible friends, you included in that. But it still feels so disconnected, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's like, hey, I bought your book and you're like, yay! And then nothing. Yeah. Like, Did <laughs> so it suck? What? And then you can't reach out to them and harass them about it? Yeah. And you're just sitting here in limbo and you're like, uh, that is so funny, though, because the, literally the way you describe that, I've been through that same situation. I can't even count how many times. And then you're just like, well, you never hear back. And so yeah. I was just curious, did you read it? Did you not like it? Like, I don't know, it's just so, did you just get in our heads all the time yeah. about readers? Yeah. And then vice versa, when you're, as you know, when you pick up another person's book and you're like, oh, no. <laughs> and it's just like, what, how do I how do I say it? Do I just say nothing? Or so then you get into the other dynamic, and it's just a very interesting position we put ourselves in as self published authors. Yeah, because there's definitely this balance between being supportive and being truthful. Oh man, I feel like I'm telling on myself right now. Okay, to be fair, I have read a lot of amazing independently published books. I'm also a very helpful person. I love to help wherever I can. So I I struggle with saying no all the time or you know not today so when people ask me to arc read or beta read or something I'm like yeah sure like i'll do it and it is trick it is challenging you're like this isn't my cup of tea you know it, it is hard to say sometimes because you know everyone has a different writing style everyone has a different perspective and the last thing i want to do is say you know i didn't like what you had your story because that's not really my place to do so so yeah it's hard i usually just don't say anything it's like yeah i think i'll just not <laughs> I see. I have a caveat now. It's like, if you want me to do this, I'm going to give you constructive feedback. And if that's not what you want, I totally understand and, and move on. But, you know, at the end of the day, as authors, helping other authors, we can only give our advice and try to help. And so like, if I had the people that I had now when I was first writing the Numbers of Elokai, I probably would have been angry and just started. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't have had to redo it to the level of that now. Yeah. So it, it's a dual sword, and I guess that just comes really with the person that we see. Yeah, no, that's very true. I, just keeping in mind that everybody has different feedback and different perspectives on what they enjoy reading and writing, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but yeah, yeah I, I never want to be a detriment or a discouraging factor to another author. So I will always be encouraging. Um, and I will never disparage anything that anybody has to to write. I will always be encouraging and positive. I don't like negativity. It's not really my jam. So no, I, I kinda... agree with you. It's like, like my friend, he's about to self-publish his own book. And I said, I really like your story. But here are the things as an author that's done this, what I would suggest doing and changing. And just leaving it open in that way. It's like, I'm just trying to help. It's up to you at the end of the day. Yeah. The other thing that I'd like to do as well, and I don't know if this is helpful, we've kind of taken an interesting turn, but this is related to, you know, being a self-published author. And um, it's important when you are looking for beta readers or arc readers to 
let them know ahead of time. Here are the questions that I want you to think about while you're reading it. Or like, this is the type of feedback I want from you. Is it plot feedback? Is it grammar feedback? You know, like, is it character development, plot development feedback? Is it helpful if it's very specific? That way it kind of reigns in kind of what you're looking for. Or if you just want it all, say, all feedback, you know, um, but I've, I've tried to come at it from a reader's perspective as well. I am an author and I have my own style, but that doesn't mean that it matches somebody else's. So what I have been, I joined a writer's group recently, which has been great. Um, but reading it as a reader, you know, I'm a very avid fantasy reader. I love fantasy dystopian, YA adult. I love it all. And so reading it just as a reader, turning off my author brain is very helpful because then I can just be like, these are the literal questions I have or the things that bother me as a reader, you know, and I'll just list them out, those types of things. And it helps. It really does help. They're like, oh, interesting. As a, I, as an author, I wouldn't have considered that, but it's interesting as an outside objective reader, why you would be thinking those things. I'm like, yeah, that's just, those are the questions I had on my mind. So yeah. And that's, that comes back to it. it's beta readers and you know having this other other friends look at it are so important because they will bring up the questions that you didn't think of mm-hmm. there's always some <laughs> as much as you yeah. plan for i don't plan though so are you a plot do you plot or do you just kind of discovery write your books uh or both i have a i have a vague outline of where i want to go but then sometimes like especially in the the third memoir of the time i had a set plan and then my favorite character, Michael, was like, middle finger, I'm going this way. And I'm like, no. What do I do? What do I do, man? And then this other character is like, hey, I'll take it. And I'm like, all right. Well, we'll just roll with it. Yeah. The characters mm-hmm. in my book, they, that's, sometimes I feel like a historian. I'm just recording what's happening. And they're going to do what they're going to do. And I'm going to try to like rein in. Like, Wait, no, no, no. You don't. That's not. No, no. Mm-hmm. Okay, they, it's like, you have kids and you know, like they just go at a hundred miles an hour and you have to like, like, no, we're going over here. No, but so it's just how I feel about them. I am, I try, but the story takes, it doesn't feel good. But I find that fun. So that's as a discovery writer myself, you and I sound like we write in a similar way. Um, I always love to pick the brains of plotters because I just can't conceive of having everything down to a T and then going in and writing it because I'm constantly surprised by my characters. Like, huh, I can see why you did that. I don't really know how to account for it, but we're going to have to because you just did it anyway. So yeah, this is kind of fun. And then it's like, no, we're not doing this. No, <laughs> we're going back over there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's so, yeah. so interesting. But well, sometimes it's there's a third world that none of us have seen and then it's just like oh no i like that so much that was great <laughs> we're switching gears we're going that route but it's it's amazing how your brain that uh, at least i feel you know you feel like sound like an intuitive writer as well just almost knits things together and by the end just like that wrapped up far more easily than i expected it to so you it's know, I, it, it is when you do read the memoirs of archive if you read gone i don't wrap things up does that make sense yeah like expect especially the first two memoirs of elokai so the memoirs of elokai is actually going to be a 12 book series oh okay nice wow um like i didn't know you're not supposed to end the book on a cliffhanger like i didn't know that until like very recently and the first memoir is just like boom and it's just like but that's okay because like this is an overarching story Mm -hmm. and i forgot where i was going with this and uh, not wrapping it up at the end oh yeah so nothing is like because for me these stories nothing is ever truly wrapped up there's always that's life and trying to do justice within that is my number one priority Mm -hmm. something to keep in mind as well um i'm glad you brought that up because I think you can end on a cliffhanger. First of all, I'll go ahead and say that. I don't see any problem with that. Some people might not like it, but for, I, I didn't realize it was a 12 book series. You kept referencing the third book of Ellie I was like, Oh, is there a third book? Did I miss something? So I think that's great. So how did you plan out 12 books or did you plan out? Like, how do you know it's going to be 12 books? What if it's 15? No, it, it's 12. <laughs> okay. So you know, it's... you have the seven crusaders of destiny that mm-hmm. rise after a, in the first book. 
and then you have the Emperor of Destiny. Then you have this event that takes place that has to happen. And then you have the final war. Mm. And then you have how everything. So in the, in the, in the first moment of Okai, the story starts with the final war is done. The victor has been crowned and it's peace. And it's the historian telling his daughter the last soul in creation to decide how it all happened. How it all came to be. And like, it starts off at a pivotal moment in our world with Matthew Elokai, Danny's brother, waking up on just outside of Grandma Wisconsin as the first crusader of death is attacking. Mm. And it's the story of these crusaders and the generals of free will doing this dance with the overarching love story that starts to start playing throughout the series and how it all comes to a head in the final war. I know that's like so vague, but I'm trying to like not do spoilers, but it's Come on, I tell have, us what uh, happens in the book. No, I'm just kidding, don't. That's yeah, bad. how does it end? You're gonna be like <laughs> tell us I don't like I don't understand how what? <laughs> like I got my um when my best friend decided to take on um editing content and even that was okay. He sat me down and he said, Okay, I need you to tell me everything. And I'm like, How much time do we have? Okay, so we got like two hours. <laughs> so by the end of it, he was drunk. And he got out like a map board and he was like, I don't understand how you did this. Like, I don't understand how you created this. And I was like, it's been in my head since I can remember. Like, I remember I was sitting in my grandparents' white house and I was watching Smallville. It was the 100th episode when Jonathan Kent died. Mm. I was talking about destiny. And I remember looking over and there he was. The Emperor of Destiny, Santonic. And that's how it started. And it just, then I met Michael, my favorite character. Then over time, I met these other generals. And it wasn't until about 2015 that I got introduced to the main character, Danny. So it's just been a wild ride that I've been planning these books out and then how they connect together. So fun though. That's just such a fun, I, I, you know, hearing you say this, she's like, oh, the fondness of figuring it out and how it all connects. It's just so fun. I love being an author. It's just too. really enjoyable. Now, the problem is sitting down and actually writing. The thing. Well, yeah, that's a different, that is a <laughs> different problem to solve. The actual sitting down and writing. Don't even get me started on editing. Oof. Uh, editing is like not my favorite part, but we don't have to get into that. Uh, yeah, actually- opposite i hate the i hate this first draft oh interesting and i go back and edit and like actually because the first part of the book and the last part of the book are two very different books Mm -hmm. how i go through the revision process of blending them together like to me that's that's the fun part (laughs) so i just i know that's not me i think it's awesome i'm slightly jealous that you love that piece of it just share some of that love over here you know, some vibes I, or whatever. <laughs> well, just give, it, hey, give me some of the first one draft writing, and I'll give you some of the editing. Oh, I love drafting. I could draft all day, every day. I love drafting. It's so fun. So uh, I just enjoy it so much. But, the and go, How do I write? <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, there are days like that, but. Uh, in any case, this has been an incredible conversation. We could probably keep talking, but we are running short on time. So before we end here, where can people find more information about you and your books? And if they want to be a beta reader, how can they sign up? So I am on Amazon. Uh, just write, type in the numbers of Elkai. I am D. Alexander. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Um, the new Sky one, too. I don't know what that's about, but you can find me there. And honestly, just shoot me a message. Let's talk. Let's connect. I love meeting with my um, people that want to be fans and that are fans. And I just, I love hearing from you. So just message me. I respond to everyone unless it's very mean and then I'll cry and then block you. (laughs) (laughs) No mean messages. Don't reach out unless you're going to be nice. All right. Perfect. Well, thanks so much. This has been a great conversation. Thank you. I appreciate it. 
Thanks for listening. I know that D. Alexander and I had a really heartfelt and important conversation about the reality of self-publishing. It's definitely not all uh, rainbows and butterflies, but then again, no publishing process is. It was really good to hear his perspective on it and the things that he's doing to improve upon his self-publishing business, as well as the books that he's writing. So there's just a lot of uh, balls to juggle, so to speak, (laughs) with publishing but you can find a lot of joy in doing it. I definitely recommend it. I've had an amazing experience. So next week, oh, I'll, I'll go ahead and put a caveat in here. I know a couple couple podcasts ago, I mentioned that I was probably going to scale back to every other week. Well, after having done that, um, I think that you know I found a lot of value in this podcast, at least for myself. I want to deliver the value that I think you can get out of this podcast. So I think I'm going to start again on the weekly. I did the experiment for every other week for about a month, month and a half, and it still just doesn't feel like enough. I found myself thirsting for these conversations, um, really seeking expertise and insight from other authors. It's just kind of part of what I want to be as an author. I want to be helpful. I want to make connections and meet other people. So we're going back to every week (laughs) and we're moving into winter anyway. So the homesteading business is going to scale back. We may have to look at a seasonal type podcast situation where once spring and summer hits, I do have to scale it back if the homestead work gets too busy. So we'll have to see. But for now, moving into winter, I think weekly is going to work just fine once again. So that being said, next week, we will be talking to Chad Pettit about writing from your heart and writing truth. So it's a really amazing conversation. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about it when the, we start the episode next week. But I think you're going to want to stick around for that. Chad has amazing insights on being true to your writing, being true to your characters, and writing truth in general. So that's that. If you liked this podcast, Feel free. I'd love it if you would subscribe, share with your friends on YouTube or any of the podcast systems you might be listening. Definitely let them know where they can find more information about the podcast, dankenner.com slash podcast. And of course, if you'd like to join me, you can fill out the form at dankenner.com slash podcast. I'd love to meet with you and hear your insights as an author or um, anything related to publishing and writing editors, cover designers, you know, anything, business, entrepreneurship, a lot of it can be related to this industry. So once again, thanks for listening. And I can't wait to talk to you next week. Bye.